Okay, ladies and gents, good evening. Once again, thank you so much for giving up time this evening to join us. Um, I'm very privileged to be joined tonight by Dr. Noel Rousseau, who first and foremost I'd regard as a friend, uh, a golfing buddy. We play a lot of golf together. Um, but he is a wonderful, first and foremost, a golf professional, a wonderful player, uh, and uh, a wonderful brain. So somebody that I know you're going to get an awful lot from this evening. Um, Noel's uh, PhD uh, that he did was fascinating um, to me, and he, he can elaborate a bit more in a second, but to me, he studied really working memory capacity. So one of the ones we talk a lot about as coaches and indeed as players, you'll, you'll know we talk a lot about kind of golfers that are very externally focused uh, and guys that are a bit more, and girls that are a bit more into the golf swing and so forth. So he did some fascinating work around that and which he may well discuss in a second. But one of the beauties of Noel is his honesty. And let me give you an example of that. Recently, we're playing golf, and uh, Noel's got off to a flyer, much to my disgust. So he's a good four under through whatever it was, um, X amount of holes. And I just started to pick his brain. He said, God, you're swinging it great. You're playing well, Noel. Um, tell me, you know, where do you sit on the internal, external? Are you kind of thinking about out there? Or are you just what's going on in your head and he turned to me so well great I'll, I'll be honest with you I've been stood over the ball most of today just thinking just don't shank it and I thought wow how, how very honest and then we had a, a long conversation about that and I know a lot of what he'll discuss tonight is based around just acceptance and and honesty um, and that really is part of it a lot of it is we we experience these thoughts and a lot of psychology sometimes to me is a little bit what I'd call plastic psychology. So a lot of it's around, um, you know, just think positively, but that's, that's not real. Um, there are mornings we wake up and we're just not happy. There's, there's days when we get on the golf course to turn up and we're just not feeling right. There's days when we're nervous and the days when we aren't. And um, I think it's all part of the, the conversation. So allow me to, uh, first of all, hand over the reins to Noel as such, who uh, will um, probably take control with the screen and also uh, an opportunity to say good evening, Noel, and thank you for giving up some time this evening to spend time with us and a good evening. Perhaps maybe we can start by you just kind of introducing yourself a bit, Noel, and telling telling the guys a little bit about you and, and so yeah, forth. Thanks, Greg, um, and thanks for, thanks for having me on. Um, um, and, and anybody who's out there, yeah, I mean, I have uh, I've spent a lot of time in, in coaching and around um, psychology in, in, in various forms. I mean, sports psychology is a big, a big topic. Um, and what I'm going to share with you is, um, is what I think are some of the insights of, I don't know, 20 years in it, playing, working with, working with players. Um, so, I mean, I, I, as a young player, I was, I was okay. Um, I mean, what was really noticeable um, Inwardly, I was really able to choke. I mean, I could choke massively. I would, I mean, I suppose in my teens, you know, I could shoot in the 60s in the, in the practice round, and then I could shoot, well, yeah, I shot 95 on one of them. And then, you know, having, having obviously been utterly gutted, then shot in the 60s the next day with my buddies. I mean, that's not, that's not like choking a little bit and, you know, and just kind of not being my best. That's it's something big there. So, you know, I experienced from an early age, uh, the effect of the mind on, on performance, and it really kind of grabbed me. Um, I read all the books. I mean, every book, the proper tellers. I mean, I recently actually got a, a stack in my office. I was moving, moving my office from, to make into my son's room. I must have had 40, 40 books. But unfortunately, they all, they all had the same message, um, or the same kind of two or three messages. And I kid you not, Greg, I put all those books in the bin. <laughs> into the charity shop. I was like, you know, I don't believe in this stuff anyway. Or why would I? Why would I put that on some poor golfer even for free? So yeah, I read all the books, um, and then you know, I, I got into coaching after my my playing career failed. I mean, I wasn't a complete, you know, complete rubbish. I had some good results. I played on a Euro Pro Tour. Given that my best golf was probably two or three under, you know, I think I did quite well. So I had a couple of top tens. I had to play my best to do that. So you know, I wasn't a complete. Um, completely useless under pressure. There were good days, but now some calamities. So you know, I was thoroughly, thoroughly intrigued, and I could see, I could see the, you know, the value in, in, um, in sports psychology. So I did, I did all the courses, um, and and I doubled down. I did more courses, and I really wanted to learn 
what really makes people perform well and perform well in, in a complex movement, you know, like the golf swing. But the more I got into it and the more courses I did, um, the kind of further I got away from, from the answers I wanted, and it just became really uncomfortable. Um, the whole idea of thinking positive, etc. Some of the things that I know you've spoken about in your webinars, I was just really uncomfortable with it. It didn't fit, it didn't fit my experience as a, as a player or, or as a coach. Um, I, did, I did set off working you know, um, as, a, as a sports psychologist in golf. I, um, I was lucky enough to have some, some good players early on and we had some fantastic um, results straight off the bat. I would have players, you know, the week after meeting, they'd have their best result um, ever on tour or they'd, or they'd win their first Euro Pro Tour. Brilliant stuff. But then they'd come back, you know, two weeks later wanting, wanting more of that kind of What's in the smarties, I call it. They want me to kind of fluff them up a little bit, make them feel good about themselves. And, <laughs> you know, I, just, I just couldn't sustain it. And, and the model I had, the model I was working with, wasn't sustainable. Um, so eventually I got out. I got out of, once I got out of sports psychology, I stopped advertising my services as a sports psychologist, um, particularly when I worked with a team and you know, I was delivering this presentation. And I, I suppose one of the defining moments was Tyrrell Hatton sitting with his feet on the table on his mobile phone throughout the whole presentation. I mean, bless me, it was, it was like, I don't know, 16, 17, but I did think, yeah, maybe I'm not really getting the message across that I, that I should be here. Given his success, um, that was probably an accurate reflection. So um, <laughs> well, I went to academia. I mean, somewhere around that point, um, I mean, I'm a coach still, I'm interested in the mind. So I went into my, to my studies of, of the mind and the movement and how they combine. So, so that's gonna help me in my coaching and also in the whole kind of sports psychology arena. Um, and then, you know, I finished that, that took eight years, um, and I, I really wanted myself to come out of that with this really kind of clear objective and this lovely kind of research project that I could share with the world and make, make golf an easy game to play. Yeah. <laughs> Guess what? I mean, I didn't, that didn't happen either. I've put a lot of time into this one. Um, and I don't believe in any of the thoughts and emotions stuff. My research is like, has no clear objective there. Um, so I'm a little bit stuck. And then I had a bit of a breakthrough more recently, I was about five or six years ago, um, and I was teaching some beginners, and one of them was a psychotherapist. And she was like, hey, what's with the, you know, what's with the PhD, and you know, how does that work? So I explained it a bit. So she's like, oh, so you're a sports psychologist. So I had to say, well, no, because I just don't believe in it. I don't believe in, in this and that. And, and she was brilliant. And Anne-Marie, um, she said to me, no, I mean, she's a CBT therapist. And, um, you know, and in charge of a whole team of CBT therapists, she said, no, that's not how we do it these days. Um, things have moved on and performance psychology has moved on. And, um, and we shared a lot of time together. We shared the, uh, she took me through a whole performance program of, of a number of weeks. And for a long time, we shared lessons with um, performance psychology. Um, bear in mind, you know, this lady deals with some, some full on, you know, cases of deep anxiety and, you know, horrible stuff that is, you know, that, that people have to deal with. So um, fantastic to meet Anne-Marie and for her to, to share that model with me. I, and now I, I'm happy to say, you know, fully comfortable and excited to be back in sports psychology with um, Anne-Marie um, at my side. Um, I mean, it's great to have uh, a psychotherapist with you. I mean, if you're going to offer mental support, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel comfortable, you know, with dealing with real life anxiety. So, you know, great to have, um, have that as well. We also teamed up with a, with a guy called Trevor who, who did play the tour, came off the tour, um, and had the, had the same experience, just hated, I, didn't, I don't know if I talked about Trevor, so Trevor Jones had a complete dislike for sports psychology, he said every, everything I tried made me worse, uh, and then subsequently coming off the tour, I found something called acceptance commitment therapy, which I'm going to share some of it with you. So he somehow found out about me and um, connected, and we've got this kind of great um, network now of people who you know, kind of see things the same way, so that's, that's really helpful. There, there is light at the end of the, the negative thoughts, <laughs> so yeah, let me let me explain that journey and uh, and some of the you know some of those enlightening moments along the way. Um, so you know throughout the last all, all my time in 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 that world um, and all the books that I've read and have subsequently been all the books, as I say, say said the same said, had the same message. It was don't think about your swing. You know we've all heard that a million times. You've read a, a Bob Mattella book. You know you're familiar with that. And then this idea that you've got to control your thoughts and emotions. Think positively, be relaxed, be calm, um, be positive, 
uh, and that way you're going to you're going to play your best golf. Now, as I say, I, I struggled with both of those in, in a big way, and, and let me explain a little bit why that stuff is limited, uh, and and a better way to go. Well, I believe it's a better way to go about things, and it's, it's supported by a lot of um, scientific evidence. Now, let me say at this point, you know, I'm going to I'm going to explain my objections to this stuff, but I mean, my, object, my objections are to the, the concepts, not to any of the people working in sports psychology. There's some, some brilliant, talented, skillful people and well-meaning people. Um, so, you know, I'm not trying to disparage anybody, um, but I, I do want to speak freely of, what, of, of some of the philosophical concepts that I think are actually holding sports psychology back and holding players back. Yeah, um, that's healthy though, no. I mean, that, and that's the, the whole idea of today. Um, just it's an alternative view. That's no different to the golf swing, is it? I think it's healthy. Yeah. I have no problem with that at all, and nor should anyone. So, anyway, sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Right. And, and you know, the more the more people I speak to around this kind of stuff, um, what what I'm uh, what I'm going to share with you, I don't think it is an alternative view. Everybody I speak to are like, uh, yeah, that's kind of my experience. I, I didn't believe in this or that, and I had a, I had a problem with 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 X, Y, and Z. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the model of, of, our, of sports psychology should fit our experience, right? I mean, if, I mean here's, here's an example. I, I mentioned to, a, I, did a, I did a recent um, sports psychology um, seminar at my club if, yeah, for, for club members and some, like, some of my students. And, and I said to, the, to our, our group director, so we're part of like 10 golf clubs, and the, and the group director is a, is a PGA pro, and I said, yeah, I'm doing this, this sports psych presentation if you fancy coming along. And he's a Scottish guy. He said, "No, I'm I'm pretty skeptical of sports psychology. I'm, you know, I'm not into it." And um, I don't know what, what response he was expecting, but I said to him, "I said, Scott, you are you are within your rights. You are absolutely validated to not like sports psychology. I mean, there'll probably be a good reason. I mean, what's what's what what happened?" He said, "He said, no, I I played. I can I'll never forget the best round of golf I ever played was the day after I got dumped by my girlfriend when I was younger, and I was in love with this girl." He said. I was absolutely a broken man the next day. <laughs> On my knees, I had my ego was through the floor. I hated myself, um, and I just played on a, a level that I've never, never been back to since. Um, <laughs> you know, so I mean, we could we could talk about that on, on on how that works and why. But I think the interesting thing there is, I mean, because because his experience of of how he played doesn't didn't fit the model of what he, he thought was sports psychology, that the idea that you've got to feel good about yourself and be confident, he lost absolutely all confidence in, in all sports psychology and just shut up the whole thing. So it's important that um, what we talk about and the advice we give fits people's experience, or at least can be flexible enough to fit, to fit people's experience. So, so moving on to you know, that the whole don't think about your, your swing thing. Um, so there's Bob Otella, you, know, you cannot hit a golf ball well, you can't hit a ball consistently well if you think about the mechanics of your swing as you play. I and mean, if you've read one of his books, you've read them all, they have that same message. Yeah. yeah. And a few other messages about short game. But, I mean, that's kind of it, right? And then, of course, that's pretty typical. The final goal is to convert your athletic swing to pure instinct rather than conscious thought. We kind of go with that one, we? That's, um, that's a reasonable statement from David Ledbetter. So, Thinking about swing thought, I mean, thinking about our experience of it, you know, we, I can kind of see how, how these, these ideas come about, um, both from a, an experiential perspective and also from the, from the research as well. So, you know, if you think about, if you think about your, well, first of all, if you think about your worst days, I mean, we are all, we are all as golfers aware of what it's like to think too much about it. I don't know who, who, who came out with the term paralysis through analysis, but I mean, I'm pretty sure it was a golfer. Um, we get this stuff. We can completely tie ourselves in knots, and we know we know what it's like when we do that. And then on the other hand, we you know we we are aware that you know when, when we when we play when we play especially well, it's easy to sit back and reflect afterwards and think, you know what? I actually I don't think I had a swing thought out there today. I was really I was really kind of in the flow. I was in this zone place where there was no yeah, it just all kind of happened, and it was a kind of spiritual thing. And then there's all, all the studies on flow, et cetera. And, you know, and there's, some, there's some merit in that. Some days it happens like that. But you will also have experience that not thinking about your swing does not take you to that place. You know, it's not a kind of cause and effect thing. So because when you played really well, you didn't think about your swing, it doesn't mean, ah, oh, so if I don't think about my swing tomorrow, I'm going to get back to that place where everything was easy. I mean, <laughs> I was going to say, until you go out and snap hook 
eight of your tee shots, then it's oh, like, yeah, oh, well, that doesn't work. Right? Mm. Everybody's trying it because they, they've heard the sports psychology advice, right? Yeah, I did play really well tomorrow. And I'm not thinking about my swing. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna play and be that kind of spiritual thing. And, um, 85, 85. Absolutely. Three lost balls. Uh, yeah. Okay. And you know, and, and most people give up by the fifth. I, I can't, I can't do this. I mean, you, you start, you start counting it right. I mean, at which point are you, are you going to intervene and start thinking about how you control your movement? It's going to happen at some point. Um, so the two, the two are linked. I mean, you know, playing well and not thinking about the swing, but it's not, it doesn't, it's not as easy as don't think about the swing and, you, and you're going to play, you're going to play your best. Equally, we have the other experiences. We, you know, we all know what it's like to, um, to, to think, have, perhaps have had a lesson, have, have quite a lot in our mind, but somehow it kind of works together and the thoughts fit and we, we play really well for a number of weeks. We know what it's like to, to play well with swing fit. So, you know, it can't be as straightforward as that. So this is my research was um, how, much, how much we think about our swing and how useful it is and, is, and how straightforward it is. And it came about because I had this intervention. I mean, this was back in the day when, when I, was, I, I was of the belief that less swing thought is better. That was the whole philosophy of the academy I was working with. And we had this intervention, which was, which successfully um, takes swing thought out of it. It's a brilliant intervention, and you have to try it if you haven't. You essentially stand behind the ball, get yourself settled, walk in, put the club down, and hit it. It's not a happy Gilmore, but it's not a million miles away. I mean, you're taking a little bit more time. There's a whole kind of rhythmical step to it. Um, you don't have to kind of rush in, but the moment that club hits the floor, you take it away. There's literally not time to, uh, to think and kind of start the, the mental process. And, and, uh, and I was using this drill, well, I used it with myself a lot, uh, uh, very successfully, because I, um, I was really kind of stuck in my swing. I used it a lot with clients, and some clients um, absolutely loved it. I mean, I remember one, one student, this client used a high handicap, but like, in fairness, one student loved it so much, she literally stopped the session there and then, I mean, after doing this a few times, and said, that is it, I am done. <laughs> and, then he, and I saw him like a year later, and he was still like, thank you so much. That has been a revelation that has changed my game. <laughs> um, and it was, I mean, it's hugely liberating. It's an incredible exercise, that. But some people hated it. Um, some people absolutely hated it. And I'm standing there thinking, this is not, this is not going well. Back out. <laughs> that coaching scenario. I don't want to back out. I'm going to look ridiculous. <laughs> Um, I worked the drill with a, with, with a tour pro who loved it for certain shots. The tee shot, not too much to think about there, and loved it. Freed them up every time. Um, he, he, he shared it with his buddy, who is um, Jamie Donaldson, um, you know, a cup hero. Hated it. was almost sick when he tried it. I mean, so, you know, it's not, it's not that stressful. So when we look at, at swing thoughts, there's a number of things going on. I mean, first of all, we've got to think about the task. What, what, what is actually the, the movement task all about? So... First of all, how, how complex is it? I mean, if it's, is it a, a really simple task, like, um, I don't know, um, doing the ironing? So simple uh, in its complexity, pretty easy, not skillful, and repetitive, repetitive's a big thing, but you want to be doing all day long without thinking about it. Um, is it, are there any other demands? Um, so take, take juggling, for example. Let's imagine you're, you're kind of juggling a few balls. Uh, I, I can't juggle, but I mean, just understanding a bit about movement, I'd imagine when you're juggling, there's not a lot of thought on technique. Because one's, one would need to be aware of the whole timing aspect of the balls and, and this kind of, this kind of aware, awareness of space, and just keeping the, kind of the, the arms moving without too much thought. So there's a lot of timing and there's a lot of external thought for client um, to get that timing right. So mechanically simple, externally we need our attention out there. So I'd imagine jugglers have very little thought about how they're moving their hands, but a lot on, on the cues of where the balls are. Um, putting, for example, imagine, I mean, imagine you're putting, you're hitting, you're hitting six foot putts on a putting rail, on a flat, on a flat um, piece of green, or even in the studio. You're hitting, ball, you're hitting balls time and time again. I mean, that becomes very repetitive. It's a very simple movement. Um, that, by the way, wants to be completely automated. You just give that over to automatic processes and you just repeat time and time again. Um, I mean, what's happening there, of course, is your, your, your mind's creating a, um, a, a memory trace and, and it's hooking onto that and just kind of repeating. Of course, that's not golf. Um, but incidentally, that's how all the research on automaticity is carried out. Um, you know, when, when you hear people say, you know, I've, I've read the research and, and it's, it's true, you shouldn't think about this thing. That's because researchers are researching this stuff on six foot putts on a flat lie time and time again. 
that is not the same as hitting a high draw off a downslope, you know, with a three iron, is it? In, in a university lab. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So, so the task is important. How complex is it? How, how repetitive is it? Do you have to instigate the task? So often with the yippers I work with, I, I work with a lot of, um, a lot of yips um, cases, people, um, we are often get them to use drills where they don't have to kind of start the movement. They're, they're kind of already started it. We keep the thing moving. Absolutely incredible. As they kind of lead in to help help with you. Um, that becomes a little bit more automatic. But, um, you know, as we know, um, the full swing and putting aren't the same thing. Um, the environment's changed. So, you know, just, just moving on from task, I would say putting, typically, I wouldn't want a great deal of technical thought, if any, although we know, I mean, I've read recently, Tiger kind of thinks of that right hand powerfully as he controls the club. But he's done that so often, that, that club and arm have become this whole kind of um, body map, and it's all, all one to him anyway, that's not, that's not the thing. Short game, I would suggest you don't want a great deal of thought there. You want to have your attention on... Um, length of swing, speed of swing, scuff in the ground, how you want that club interacting with the ground. I mean, I wouldn't say that as blanket advice, there's plenty of room for other thoughts as well, but typically you want it external on the control and feel factors. Um, you hear a lot about people getting too involved in their short game. I mean, you and I have discussed this many times, you need to have good technique. Yeah. So when we, when we talk about skill thoughts, we talk about skill level as well, that's why swing thoughts, we talk about skill level. Um, and that's fairly, fairly instinctive. As a, as a beginner, you need to think about it. You haven't, you haven't earned the right to be automatic yet. But the thinking is then, as, as you get better, expert performance happens with no conscious thought. But when you get to a really good level, like everybody watching, um, the whole thing becomes completely unconscious, and any conscious thought gets in the way. That's the model. But we know, as good players, we, we want to keep evolving, we want to improve our technique, we want to hit the ball further, we need to adapt. And any kind of... Any kind of um, effort to change your swing is going to take some level of swing thought, and that's going to take you back on that step. So, you know, if you want to keep evolving your technique, if you want to hit it further, you know, you, it's, it's not a case of just don't think about your, your swing. How, how and what you think about um, varies. So, you know, when we think about how, I mean, there's a difference between just, just being aware of a movement and, and observing it um, to actually really trying to control it and change your movement. I mean, th th think when you, are, when you are trying to change your swing. I mean, that is absolute control, as opposed to just being aware of a club face or the weights of the shaft at certain areas of the swing. That's clearly a different thing. And we know that what we focus on in the swing um, makes a huge difference. Um, I know you've shared a number of times, Greg, the, um, uh, the, the research of, of Gabby Wolf with external and internal focus, which yeah. one of the is, is, you know, is fits and it's it good. Um, you know, although we're not, you know, not universally applicable. But there's other things as well. I mean, you could have a, a swing thought of, um, you know, an internal swing thought of turning your body back and turning your body through. It's a very holistic thought. It's about a whole movement. That is not particularly taxing on the brain and is not going to get in the way of your performance. Um, so are you thinking about part of your movement or are you thinking about your whole movement? Uh, and clearly, once you start breaking it down into parts, it gets a little bit a little bit heavier on your working memory and your processing. Um, is it an analogy? Is it a, is it a movement analogy? You know, like table tennis forehand or, or the frisbee analogy. I mean, these things hold an, an enormous amount of information that we hook onto without having to consciously break it down and, and think about it. And then, you know, one thought. You know, you have you have a thought one day. That's that's not going to be the same the next day. Our, our our, um, our memory structures change from day to day as you as you sleep. The you, know, you chunk information. Um, your brain changes the way it kind of relates to it, and you come back the next day. In fact, you know if you ever change your swing, you'll know this. You kind of chase this feeling, which is really odd and weird. And you go away, you sleep on it, you come back two days later, and that feeling is somewhat different. Most of the time, that's quite comforting. You know, the feeling that you were chasing now feels less odd. But then, then we're often trying to trying to chase that odd feeling because we're not sure whether it's whether it's right or not. But my point being that you know, as we as we learn and we um, and we adapt and we and we get better, our our swing feelings and thoughts change, and what what works one day isn't going to work the next day. So you know, back to my back to my studies, we had I had five experiments over eight years 
uh, with this intervention. You know, the, the, the flow drill as it was, you know, walk in, start there and hit it. We, we tested people under baseline and we tested people um, you know, under, a, um, under a pressure scenario. And what we found initially was, you know, and I, bear in mind, I was working with a group of about 30 players, all handicapped kind of plus one to five maybe, so certainly category one. And what we found out initially was with, uh, so people were, were using the intervention, so they were using the drill and they weren't using the drill. And what we found out was nothing, absolutely nothing initially. I mean, it was, it was slightly crushing because I'm <laughs> four years into this by now, Greg, there's a master's degree gone by. <laughs> That's good then. That. <laughs> Like, that can't be true. And I've seen it with my eyes. I've seen this guy. And I mean, and I can tell you, the people who are coming up to the back, I can tell you that guy there, he's probably going to get better with this drill. He's going to hate it. I mean, it wouldn't be accurate entirely. I have a pretty good idea by this point. But, um, you know, the way the way research goes, you have to use the mean, so the average. Yeah. Um, but at that point, anyway. So, but, you know, as, as the saying goes, my, my, my head's in the oven and my feet are in the freezer. But on average, I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> and that's what I was seeing with this. I was seeing that some people were getting better, considerably better under pressure. And some of them were hating it and getting worse. But um, from a research perspective, you know, I was, I was kind of stuck. So we did more studies. We looked at how long they would stand at the ball um, and how much they would think. We looked at, I had, them, I had another study where they would, you know, it's quite, quite an awkward drill initially. So we'd have them do a six week learning period. So they'd go away, they'd learn, they'd learn to hit like that and they'd come back and Still nothing, absolutely nothing, except this, this massive gap in, in, in the group. Some got better, some got worse. So there's some, there's some personality um, factors going on there um, that previously had, had never been looked at. And, and this, this was not. So now we're saying that we're, we're no longer going to work with the average. We're going to, work, we're going to look at this from a personality, from an individualistic perspective. So I had to think about what might, what might affect how people process information. And we looked at short-term memory, working memory, and also how people think about the world in terms of do they think more in pictures, which is quite a kind of fluid, quick um, way of thinking, or are they, or do they think more in kind of word, uh, words, are they more visual or verbal, the words being more kind of heavy and kind of cumbersome when, it's, um, when it comes to you know, controlling movement. Yeah. So just very quickly, working memory is your ability to Remember, uh, hold something in your memory while processing at the same time. So the, so the, the tests for that are, um, you, you, you're kind of given this list of sentences and you have to answer the question five while remembering the last word of question two. And it kind of goes <laughs> down and down, it's so stressful. Um, so we had, we had high working memory and we had low, low, low working memory. But you know, the relevance to golf is that, that's kind of what we're doing when we're, when we're thinking about our swing. We've got, we've got all this movement going on and we're trying to process this information and remember our thoughts and control stuff. Um, and it was at this point we got, we got a bit of a breakthrough. Now, now we're starting to see that you know, there, there is a difference and there's a difference, in, um, a difference that correlates with working memory capacity. Short term memory was interesting. And and the, the visual verbalizer um, situation. So what we found was that the people with high working memory capacity were actually found the exercise more helpful. It was interesting. What was actually happening is the guys who, were, who uh, had low working memory capacity found it unhelpful. They didn't have the, the ability to um, uh, place their attention in the right place to concentrate well enough doing the exercise. I think that is actually what was going on more, more than anything. The guys with high working memory capacity were, uh, did the exercise fine. A lot of them got, got, got the gains from a swing thought, but um, you know, they had the whereabouts to, to still manage in that, that quick fire drill. So we got this, this situation where you know, people, people's brains are, are, are different. You know, we know they're all, they're all put together differently. Something called um, cognitive architecture. We had, um, I, remember, I remember while doing the trials, um, one of the one of the tests was a, a quick number recall test for short term memory. So you know, if I said to you, Greg, if I said to you, repeat these numbers five six nine two, could you do that? Not a hope. Go on then, five six nine two. There you go. Five six nine two seven. Five six nine two. Five six nine two seven. Five six nine two seven. Great. I mean, so that's that's five, right? 
Um, so I've, got it. I've got the magic. Ah, yeah. I'm not going to go on. I'm not, I'm not convinced, Greg. <laughs> I'm not going to go on. <laughs> Let's leave it there then. So, so we're testing these people, and, uh, and, and everybody in the test um, was at the University of Birmingham, and they had straight A's at A level. Okay? These are smart people, without question. Smart, dedicated. Bear in mind, my A levels were uh, two C's and an E. Okay? These are smart people. <laughs> but, um, I had, I had some people, most people got between, I don't know, six and, six and nine on the number recall. So I remember a couple of, couple of people just smashed it all the way through to 12, and that's where the test ends. So just 12 numbers off the bat. Um, and I remember, I remember two students um, couldn't get past four. Six, nine, three, two. Couldn't, couldn't repeat that back. Um, which I thought was really interesting. I mean, smart people, but clearly, you know, the way our skills and, and our cognitive um, skills are, are all different and they all kind of merge differently. And, uh, and that changes the way that we control movement and, and think about the world and, and, and communicate. Um, incidentally, do, do, you know the, do you know the world record on that? 72, something like that, 70, in the 70s, wasn't it? Something was it? like 450. There you go, I was close then, I was close. <laughs> I, might, I might not be in China, but it's, it's over 300. It's absolutely staggering. Um, and wow. clearly that's, that's chunking techniques. Yeah, and, I was yeah, memory. That's a slightly different skill, but um, yeah, great. Still impressive. Um, anyway, so, so my point there, Greg, I mean, amidst all that noise and all those factors, you know, at which point... Can you say to somebody, um, you know what, don't think about your swing. You've got all these different tasks, you've got people with, with different brains, personalities, learning histories, different skill levels, they might be changing their swing, they might not be. Um, how can you tell somebody, just don't think about your swing? Clearly, that is good advice at some point with some tasks and some people. Um, and again, it comes back to the experience. I remember being at a, a seminar with coaches that, that you put on a number of years ago and a very well-respected coach in the England set up, stood up and he said, sports psychologist, he said, um, all they say is don't think about the swing. And again, it completely and utterly, um, you know, he'd lost all confidence in using sports psychologists for this blanket of them. So there we go. That's a, a quote from McElroy. He clearly likes a swing thought or two. And, and in his words, it helps him with the pressure, which is entirely against the um, research. So don't think about the swing. You know what? It's not accurate. It, it's a much more complicated thing than that. And I would love to have had my eight years research and wrap it up in a parcel and, and be able to, you know, as I say, make the game easier. That's not the case. You know, we, we need to understand how we work in different scenarios with different movement patterns. It's more complicated. If you've enjoyed this video, then please click subscribe and I'll keep you up to date with more coaching information. And if you really want to take your game to the next level, then please visit my website, golfcoach.online, where you'll see there my subscription channel, which is Golf Coach Access, which is all about building a golf coaching and education community and having really structured long-term programs. And the best thing is you can get immediate free access.